Welcome everyone to the fourth talk of this term at Scientific Society. Today we have the pleasure of hosting Professor Kieran Clark with us. I'll just give a quick introduction before we get started. So Professor Clark has a BSc from Flinders University in Adelaide and has a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Queensland in Australia. After her postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard Medical School, she worked for the National Research Council of Canada. Professor Clark joined the Department of Biochemistry at Oxford in 1991. Her research is focused on how diet alters energy metabolism in human heart, brain, and skeletal muscles. Today, Professor Clark will talk about development and use of a ketone ester drink that improves endurance performance in athletes and could be used for the management of common metabolic diseases such as type 2 diabetes, heart failure, and Alzheimer's disease. So please join me in welcoming Professor Clark. Thanks. Ooh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm going to actually talk about the work that has been going on for about 30 years. So I've been in Oxford since 1991. And so, and this work started at the beginning and you can see how it leads through um, to something that's actually being sold uh, in the United States at the moment. So anyway, um, uh, so it's, it's how we worked on a ketone ester and um, it's been, it, it may be a panacea or maybe snake oil, but anyway. So, so this starts out with, um, with how we get our energy. So we, we, as you all know, we get our energy from eating food. And you can divide food up into um, protein, carbohydrate and fat, as we all know. And if you look at it, um, the protein and the carbohydrate break down to glucose. And the glucose is, is what is taken up into cells and used for energy. Glucose is a simple molecule, six carbons, lots of oxygen, six, and uh, easy to metabolize, so easy to burn. So it doesn't need much oxygen to burn it. Compared with fat, uh, which is, um, a long chain, lots of carbons in it, and hardly any oxygens. So fat takes a lot of oxygen to burn it. In and so, um, so uh, we have so we have mainly glucose and fatty acids used for energy. And this may the amount of oxygen needed to burn it makes a big difference uh, when you come to um, sport and exercise. So that makes or heart attacks or something like that. But anyway, um, uh, when you're not eating, you break down fat, fat you mobilize fat, and it form, goes to the liver, and the liver makes ketones. And so ketones are perfectly normal, found in the body. Uh, Beta-hydroxybutyrate is the main one, acetyl, and that goes to acetoacetate. But the beta-hydroxybutyrate is formed when you haven't eaten, usually, or if you're on a ketogenic diet. But, but it's made from fat, perfectly normal, found in everybody. Nobody can survive without it because if you didn't have uh, ketone bodies, you wouldn't survive hunger. You wouldn't probably overnight. So nobody exists without uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. So um, if you look um, at, and the reason that oxygen is important is because uh, for example, when you're exercising, if you're uh, doing endurance exercise or if you're not exercising at all, you mainly use fat. And that's because you've got plenty of oxygen there to burn it. However, as you increase in exercise intensity up to a sprint, you can see you switch what you're using for energy. So it switches from fat to, to carbohydrate. So um, here the fat goes down and carbs. And, and you, you can sprint for about 90 minutes before you run out of carbs, and you can't use the fat at all uh, when you're sprinting. Okay, and that's to do with oxygen availability, actually. Okay, so, so why don't we just have all carbs? I mean, obviously. And the reason is because we actually store a lot of uh, our nutrients in our body, so, which we have to do to survive overnight even. And um, if you look at storing of carbohydrate or car glucose is stored as glycogen. And um, glycogen, we can store about 2,000 kilocalories as glycogen. And that's because 
we can only store that much. It's not that much. It only lasts for about 90 minutes. And that's because it's very hydroscopic. So it binds a ton of water. So if you have any more than 2000 kilocalories, you're too bulky with too much glycogen. So then you, ha then you have to switch to fat. And we can, we can store about 125,000 kilocalories as fat. Now, obviously, some people store a lot more than that, but it's because fat is very hydrophobic, and so you don't store water with it, and so it's a very small, can energy-dense molecule, and that's why we store mostly fat and hardly any carbohydrate. Oh. This is driving me nuts. And an example of this was in 1992, when um, Ranoff Fiennes and Mike Stroud decided that they were going to cross the Antarctica. And uh, they decided that they wouldn't take dogs. They were going to do it themselves, just to, and they had to carry everything. So because there's no um, McDonald's in Antarctica, they had to take absolutely everything with them on these sleds. And so they were very heavy and they were, they were um, going across at temperatures of minus up to minus 55 or down to minus 55 and at altitude and they were out for about three months and um, they took a diet that was mostly fat because it's energy dense with some carbohydrate and some protein and they were using 5,500 kilocalories a day which is a massive amount I mean I have about 1,600 calories a day and so 5,500 but they were using 7,000 to 11,000. So, so um, rowers, when they're training or just about to go on a race, they can use that much and they can never eat enough to be able to replace it. So, so they're semi-starved, but not as much as these people were. And in the end, Mike Stroud is a, a slightly nutty doctor and so he needed an excuse to go on this three months away. And so he, what he did was he took blood samples all the way across and urine samples. And then he, he didn't have any trouble freezing them, but then he brought them back and assayed them. And the glucose levels in the body were so low, they were almost unmeasurable. So, and, it was, and the reason that they could survive without going into a coma was because they were, making, they were living on ketones. So, they were, they'd, so what was happening was that they were mobilizing fat, it went to the liver, and the liver made the ketones to feed the brain. So the brain survives only on glucose and, and ketones, and it can't survive on fat at all. So you have to have ketones to feed the brain. But at the time, so they both lost about 25% of their body weight. So um, Ranoff Fiennes lost 25 kilos, and um, uh, Mike Stroud lost 22 kilos, so going across Antarctica. And so they almost died, but fortunately they didn't. So, okay, so what's happened, what happens when you're fasting? Um, here, what happens, you try to make glucose for the brain. So first of all, the glucose comes from what you've just eaten. And then after a while, you've run out of that after about four hours, and then you break down glycogen. So that only lasts for about, at the most, 24 hours. So you can see here, you're making glucose from glycogen, your storage, and then you run out of glycogen, in, and glycogen's mostly in your liver, but also in muscle. Then you start making glucose from muscle. So you, your brain is desperate for the glucose, and the body goes to a huge extent to make glucose for the brain, to keep it going. And so, so it makes glucose and then you can see it starts to drop and that's because the ketones kick in. So the ketones get high enough to feed the brain. And so the brain switches from glucose to ketones. And so, and you can see here it goes out to about 40 days. And in fact, um, if you're starving, you'll last for about 60 days, between 50 and 60 days. And what you die of um, when, you're, when you're starving to death uh, you, and assuming you've got enough water, but what, what you die of is you die of asphyxiation because all of your um, diaphragm has gone, has been eaten away because it's muscle, and so you can't breathe. And so after about 60 days, you'll be dead. But it, tell me, it's not a very nice way to die. But anyway, um, 
And what's happened over this time, you can see your ketone levels go up. So by about seven days, your ketone levels are quite high. Beta-hydroxybutyrate levels are about four to five millimolar, maybe six. But acetoacetate doesn't go up so much and the fatty acids don't go up so much. Okay, so that's why we have ketones. Nobody exists without them. They're perfectly natural. And um, so we started working in Oxford on these um, in 1993, and um, when Richard Beach came to visit the lab, and w at the time we were in the old biochemistry department, which used to be a seven foot uh, story tall building that was a total blot on the Oxford landscape and has now gone. But um, he came to the department and, and wanted us to perfuse um, hearts in the magnet. And this is my first DPhil student here. And uh, at the time, we were uh, one of the few people in the world, or places in the world, that actually had NMR. So, so we were doing spectroscopy uh, long before MRI turned up. And we were perfusing hearts in the magnet and looking at energy levels. And what we found, and what Beach wanted us to do, was to perfuse hearts with ketones. And I'd never even heard of them before. So you can see. What happened was, if you perfuse hearts with glucose, um, they were fine, but then you increase the efficiency of the heart by 28% or 24%. And what happened was that the ketones could replace insulin in the heart. And if you had both ketones and insulin, it gave an increase in 36% in, in efficiency. So then, 10 years later, there was, um, it, there was a beginning of the, uh, well, it wasn't the beginning, the, uh, something called the Iraqi War. No, this is ancient history. Yes. Okay, ancient history. But in 2003, there was a war. Uh, the Americans were fighting. And what was happening was that they were, um, they were shooting. Um, they, they were friendly fire. Have you heard of friendly fire? Yes. So what was happening was that they were going out into um, the theatre, which is really what we call a battlefield, and this, their soldiers, and they call them um, battle fighters, war fighters, war fighters. They were, the war fighters were going out into the theatre and shooting anything that moved, and it was usually each other. And it was rather upsetting to the army at the time. And, and so that what they wanted was a way to make a really efficient food uh, and so they gave us um, 10 million to develop a food based on ketones. Okay, so then, oh. so then we did, we set out, we had $10 million, we set out and we tried every different ketone there was that to, we could try. It had to be uh, digestible. So we, we couldn't inject it or anything, you had to be able to drink it. Okay, so. Um, we went around the world trying to find some way of doing this. And finally somebody said, why don't you just go next door to the chemistry department and talk to Jeremy Robertson? And so I did. I'd never heard of him before, even though in the building was next door. And um, he invented, made a whole lot of esters, ketone esters for us, and uh, because he's a chemist. And here we can ha have Kirill, who was working on the project, who was a postdoc on the project, making the ketone esters down in the basement of the chemistry department here in a tiny little room and with no windows, and which is why he looks so miserable here. But anyway, here they are. And so they'd make us a whole lot. And chemists make things and put them into little bottles and with labels on them. And so they'd make us a whole lot of these chemicals and we would have to sit around and try them all and see which one tasted the worst or the best, as it were. And um, so here you can see that this is some, one of the bottles and it, they taste it's all so bad that we had to have chases afterwards. So you can see sitting around drinking beer afterwards. So, okay, so then uh, we ended up with a monoester, beta-hydroxybutyrate, beta-hydroxybutyl, um, beta-hydroxybutyrate, and we called it Delta G. And as you know, have you all, have you heard of Delta G? Yeah, good, okay, that's great. So Delta G, so we, and the reason we called it Delta G is because the um, 
when we said what it was called to the um, army, to the generals at our meetings, the DARPA meetings, they just hated it. They just hated this chemical name. So we, and they loved Delta G because of Delta Force, of course. And so, um, and that comes from the Gibbs Helmholtz, Gibbs Helmholtz equation. And so uh, we have um, trademarked the Gibbs Helmholtz equation. So to use, and what we're aiming for is to get our um, levels of, B, of ketone at about four millimolar, four to five millimolar here. And it's way below what you would see in diabetic ketoacidosis. And it's only about half of what you get on a ketogenic diet, okay? So what we did was we um, made, we made this using a biochemical method, using a lipase, and that made our monoester and that's broken down to the, in the gut to butane dial and beta hydroxybutyrate. The butane dial goes to um, the liver and is made into beta hydroxybutyrate, and they go into the blood and straight into tissue. Okay, so um, so you can see here's our uh, delta G uh, is broken down beta hydroxybutyrate straight through the monocarboxylate transporters and into the mitochondria. So they're instant energy. Ketones are instant energy. And when you think about it, you need instant energy to survive. So if you look at the other um, substrates, so glucose or fatty acids, they take a while to be metabolized. So glucose goes through glycolysis and fatty acids go through beta oxidation in the mitochondria. Okay, so you get instant formation of NADH, you reduce your mitochondria and that feeds in at complex one. So you've got NADH produced for complex one here, and so your electron transport chain is just immediately fed into. Um, and then you also produce succinate for succinate dehydrogenase at complex two. So it's an immediate energy into the mitochondria. Okay, so, so then uh, the army said they wanted to see whether it worked in rats, okay? So we made up three different, and they wanted three different diets. They wanted us to compare it with a Western diet um, that had 34% fat, a carb diet that was all carbohydrate, which is more or less eating muesli all the time. And then we put 30% of the calories from the ketone ester into the diet. So they were taking 30% of their calorie intake in the diet. And <clears throat> this is making, it, again, more students making it up. So here, they made it up. The, oh, the rats hated the taste of this ester. They wouldn't drink it. And so what we had to do is make it up in chow. And um, so we made it up with the berry jelly because they love, rats just love berry jelly. And so we made it up with jelly. Here you are. And we're making it up with jelly here. And then we cut it up and put it, and put it out for the rats. And so... One of the meetings, the, so DARPA has meetings every six months to find out how you're going, and, and, um, and you get kicked out if you haven't made your milestones. So, um, and I took some of this food along to show them what we were feeding rats and put it into a lunchbox and handed it round the room. And when I got the lunchbox back, it was all gone. They'd eaten a lot of this rat food. Anyway, and nobody died as far as I know, but uh, okay, so then to mimic what happens in a battlefield, we um, had to go for five days, but we had to train rats to run on a treadmill. So they're running on a treadmill, and that was the nearest thing to a battle for a rat that we could get. And rats hate running, absolutely hate running. So, and then to keep them running on this treadmill, you have to give them a tiny little electric shock. And, um, and so, I mean, it's only small, but it keeps them going until they just fall off from exhaustion. But um, some rats hate running so much that they would just rather get electrocuted than run. Okay. So anyway, they, the ones that, got, that just decided that they weren't going to run no matter what just were, became the controls. But the, 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 mat, the rats were tested for cognitive function in this maze. And they love this. So they run to the end of each of the, these um, various uh, um, sprogget things. 
and they eat sweetened condensed milk. So the Home Office loves this test. They think this is wonderful. Rats love this test too because they love the sweetened condensed milk at the end. And so then you train them and then you do the test for <coughs> five days to see if they're going to be um, able to run any further. And so th this was all blinded. So this is where they could run when they're on the chow and this was the baseline. And then as soon as they were put onto the food, they could run 30% further every day for five days than if they were on the um, carbohydrate or the ketone or the um, Western diet food. So you, you can see, um, so that was great, you know, and, but the poor students, because they were running so long, they were up until two in the morning running these rats, but anyway. So it also improved cognitive function in these rats as well. So then we went back to the army and said, right, we're ready to go into people and they said, no, you're not. You have to go to the FDA and get approval and show that it's safe in humans. And of course, we'd been drinking it all this time because we had to try it just to see what it tasted like. And so we said, well, we're not dead. And they said, no, 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 you have to go and do all this thing um, before you can go into people. So we went through the FDA. Don't even look at that, but we got FDA approval in the United States, which is why we're selling it in the United States now. Uh, and then at, the, at that time, I just didn't believe anybody would drink three drinks of this horrible tasting drink a day for five days. I just couldn't believe this was going to work. I mean, every step of this project, I just didn't believe it was going to work. Anyway, so I, we made up drinks for me and I thought, oh, I'll try it myself. And so I had these drinks made up and then, because I wasn't going to suffer by myself, I had these drinks made up for my husband. And so he had to drink those and I had to drink these and it was really tough. I really hated this. But my husband just loved it. And because he was a cyclist and it really, and he does Strava, you know, these things that everybody, all these cyclists, mad cyclists do. And he improved on all his time. So he thought this was fantastic. So he could drink it. So then we could titrate. What it, it, the amount you drink depends, it gives you the level of ketone you want in your body. So, if you, so then we set, all right, if you drink a half a gram per kilogram body weight, you'll get a, a beta hydroxybutyrate level of about three millimolar. Okay, so, so this is definitely a food. So if for somebody who weighs 50 kilos, they'll have to drink 25 mils to get them to three millimolar. And 25 mils has about 120 calories in it. So this is definitely a food. It's got calories, the same cal number of calories as glucose has. Okay, so then we, just, we went into rowers and um, this, is, this was done with UK Sport and we actually rowed people in the, on rowing machines. And we gave them a 30 minute row. Now, rowers are fantastic. They row like crazy. They're really competitive. So, so this was, these were the elite U, UK rowers. So they, these are Olympic um, standard rowers. And, um, and they're amazing so that they compete. They compete against themselves. They compete against everybody. And so they always do their best. And so we rowed them for 30 minutes because they know how to pace themselves for 30 minutes. And then we gave them a drink brought their ketone levels up to about three. And if they stayed sedentary, if they didn't row, the levels stayed up for about four hours. But if they rowed, the muscle just churned through that ketone. It just loves the ketone. So they were not just using the ketone for brain, they were using it for their muscles as well. So, and how did they do? Well, these are the results. Um, we stopped after 21 rowers because we knew that <laughs> we knew which one was which. But the rowers didn't know that we made the placebo drink taste just as bad as the real drink. And they, they didn't know because we tested them. But we did get one world record out of this and five personal bests and nine seasons best um, with the rowing. Okay. So, and it didn't matter which group we rowed. It didn't matter whether it was heavyweight men or 
lightweight men or heavyweight women or lightweight women. It was just the same for everyone. And we found, and of course, being scientists, we had to work out why it was working. And so, so what we found out first was that the power during that row continued to decrease in when they were said when they were uh, on the placebo, but when they were on the ketone, they were able to maintain their power, and it became significant after about ten to fifteen minutes of, of um, exercise. And then in the last five minutes, they go like crazy because they know they've got five minutes left. And you can see at the end, they have more power than they had at the beginning. So they just like go like crazy. And what happens is that they, the ketone is actually inhibiting glycolysis. So the ketone takes control of all the metabolism in the body afterward. So and this is our, the, the exogenous ketone. And so what happens is that it, decreases glycolysis and so it decreases lactate production. So it stops gluco glycogen being broken down and stops the um, lactate production. So we've done a million different other things to work out what's do happening, lots of rowing, uh, rowing and cycling uh, studies and we know exactly what's going on. Oh and these um, athletes also let you, they'll, they'll let you do anything but they let you take um, uh, biopsies. And so here is a study where we took six biopsies. So depending on, uh, this is in the leg muscle, and to measure all of the things going through glycolysis, through the Krebs cycle, and, and uh, breakdown of fat as well. So we know exactly how uh, the ketone is working in the body. So here is um, results from these biopsies. You can see there's actually an increase in, uh, um, well, a, a greater loss of um, fat, which we can afford, of course, because we've got so much of it, and preservation of glycogen during the exercise so that these people um, can go for longer. So people in the Tour de France can go for longer because they've got preservation of glycogen. So, so it's actually being used for sport. Um, it doesn't work on sprinting. It doesn't work at all on sprinting because the best thing for sprinting is glucose because of the oxygen. But um, for endurance sports, um, for a sport that lasts between 30 minutes and three hours, it gives you instant energy. Uh, it helps recovery. So for the Tour de France, they have a drink before the race, then they have a drink during the race, they have a drink immediately after the race, and then a drink before bed. And it stops their muscles hurting because of a glycogen loss. But um, you, they, it also helps in training, so it helps stop overtraining. So it really does work for endurance. Okay, it doesn't work for sprinting. Don't bother about it for sprinting. But it does help recovery afterwards. Okay, so, I mean, being scientists, we didn't really care that much about sports, actually. But what we do care about is um, people with diseases. And so, and we base this on whether the ketogenic diet works. And so the ketogenic diet, which is a high fat, low carb diet, works in obesity, it stops you feeling hungry, it works for Alzheimer's disease, it works for cancer, some cancers, includes epilepsy, children with epilepsy are given a ketogenic diet because it stops them having seizures, it works on Parkinson's disease, sickle cell anemia and vascular disease. And in fact, there are studies going on all around the world now using this ketone ester to see if it works in, the, in various diseases, plus other diseases as well, but anyway. Um, okay, so, and we know that it works for um, athletes, and we also know it works for skin as well. So an example in diabetes is where we just took uh, 10 uh, people with type two diabetes. This is simple type two diabetes, and we just advertised for them at the John Radcliffe 10 people said yes, they wanted to try it. So they had three drinks a day for five days. And what it did was it normalized their glucose levels 
uh, cholesterol levels went down and triglycerides in five days with three drinks. So it, it absolutely controls metabolism. Um, and also we, um, being an NMR person, uh, we looked at the liver, we looked at um, our proton spectrum of liver, and you can see here, we have a normal liver, There's, this is the water peak, and this is the fat, this is about 2% fat in a normal person. Here, in somebody who's obese, you can see here's the water and here's the fat. And so that person has about 17% fat in their liver. And, and this is what it looks like. It's got fat like that. And it's sort of, if you see a fatty liver, it's all white. Well, um, that's very common in obesity. So anyway, so they all lost, this, um, we divided them into obese people and normal people. They all lost about one kilo, but the obese people lost 3.4% of their liver fat in five days. <coughs> now, liver fat is really bad, um, mainly because you can end up with cancer um, with, with liver fat. But anyway, so it decreased liver fat. Um, it also works in uh, Alzheimer's. So you can see here, this is, this is a deoxyglucose uptake in a normal brain, and this is a person with Alzheimer's. And so they cannot take up glucose into the brain with Alzheimer's. And, so, and it's also called type 3 diabetes, actually, Alzheimer's. So you can see here, it's, um, I mean, lots of brain cells have been lost, but it, it also, the ones that are there aren't taking up nearly as much glucose. So um, we did a study in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, and it definitely decreased brain amyloid and tau. And so this was, this, these are mice that develop Alzheimer's just because they're genetically prone to doing so. But these ones didn't um, become out, uh, develop Alzheimer's. It also it decreased their anxiety. And here, if they're on a carbohydrate diet, um, they spend most of the time down the end of this part of the maze, this wing of the maze, whereas they don't really go and explore the rest of it when it's open. However, when they're on the ketone, um, they love running around. And so you can see here that they spend hardly any time down the blind end. And in fact, um, uh, we did a small study here in pa uh, patients with Alzheimer's. And, um, and in fact, we only did five people because the nurses started complaining because they said the, the men are getting too frisky and didn't, in, didn't like it at all. And so we had to stop. But anyway, I, I think that um, they became less anxious. Okay, so um, anti-aging, we, we did human dermal fibroblasts and uh, incubated them. Um, and we can show that if you irradiate them, the cells, um, with UV. Oh, well, first of all, they keep more cells alive um, with the ketone, but also if you incubate them um, and irradiate them with a uh, UV, um, you can see that the ketone, the ones with the ketones, it doesn't matter whether you have it before or after, uh, they survive a lot better. So we did radio protection. Um, here we did gamma radiation, and you can, again in cells, and you can see these are osteoblasts, and they resist the radiation more. Um, and again, proton radiation as well. So, so this is this could be it could be used, for example, um, in normal tissue to protect normal tissue in when you're getting irradiation for cancers for a tumor. Okay, so there's a difference between our uh, endogenous ketones, that's the ketones that you get when you produce them yourself in the liver and for brain energy, and um, what happens with the fat that's going around, your fat goes up, your free fatty acids go up, and you get an increase in mitochondrial uncoupling. Whereas if you have the delta G, the exogenous ketone, um, that uh, all of it goes to make beta-hydroxybutyrate and that acts on nicotinic acid receptors in fat tissue, and that 
and lowers the fatty acids and lowers uncoupling proteins, but also is the beta-hydroxybutyrate is used not just for brain energy, but for body energy as well. Okay, so we think that it could also be used for injury, traumatic injury. So if, when you have a car crash or when you have an accident, so what happens is if you have trauma, you have an increase in catecholamine release, you have a huge release of fatty acids um, from the cells, and from fat tissue actually, and then that goes to the mitochondria, prevents glucose uptake, and remember you want glucose because of the oxygen, and so and the mitochondria uncouple because it needs fatty acids to uncouple, and that causes energy depletion and increases the injury. So, so when somebody has a concussion, let's say um, in a football match, you get the head injury, all right, they're concussed, they have an injury, but then there's a penumbra. And so the cells around the, the part that has died are half dead. And they can either die or they can live. And so, um, and, and the thing that may help them live would be feeding them um, our ketone. So what happens is, um, so that the ketone actually, everything in the body controls its own metabolism. So ketones control their own metabolism by acting on fat cells, on nicotinic acid receptors in fat cells. And um, so the, the fat cells pull the fatty acids into the fat cells. So it gets rid of fatty acids. And so what happens when you have the delta G is that you, uh, it acts on the nicotinic acid receptors, pulls the fatty acids back into the fat. The glucose and the delta G are used for energy and the mitochondrial uh, uncouple less and you retain energy. So it, it probably rescues tissue around the dead tissue. So where are we now? We've actually scaled up to, we've made six tons. We make it up in a big pharma company up in North, uh, Northumberland. Uh, and we've licensed to sell it, to human to sell it. And this, they uh, launched it in um, uh, April last year. So this is it. They've, they've, um, so this box has three bottles in it, three bottles of 25 mils each. And each of those bottles cost $33. So $99 for this. And they sell it in boxes of three and boxes of 12. Okay, so, so they're selling it at the moment. Um, and where are we in Oxford? Well, we're actually um, going for broader th uh, studies. So we've just got a study in diabetes and Parkinson's done. And so we're looking at Parkinson's disease and uh, diabetes. And that's it. I just have to thank all the people who actually did the work. And thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, and I have some here. This is the raw stuff. If anybody wants to try it, you're welcome to have it. So, so you can always say that you got it here. But, um, and I, I actually brought some uh, lemonade so to take the nasty taste away if you want to try it. Right, thank you. Do we have any questions? Okay. Um, thanks for a great talk. Uh, what are your thoughts on, kind of, you showed the graph of the fasting. What are your thoughts on kind of like regular intermittent fasting versus like a low carbohydrate diet? Because I, I think the crossover point was around 16 hours. Do you think that's the best point to fast for? Like, is that? I think so. Yeah. I mean, it it's, it depends why you're doing it. You know. I I mean, I think that fa that the intermittent fasting works really well um, for losing weight, especially. But um, uh, and I'm not really sure why anybody would do it otherwise, because um, you know, because usually the people who do intermittent fasting are really healthy anyway. You know, and it, it's not. And so, you, if you're using it to lose weight, it work, It does work. It's, it, you know, and part of it is the psychological thing, of thinking if I eat outside the time, I'll, I'll just mess it all up, which is true. So, so your ketones do go up and down, but n not all that much. Only do about one millimolar. Yeah, but it, yeah. 
but it does work. Mm. Yes. Oh, gosh. So um, I know from within rowing and uh, triathlon at the moment, the interest is to kind of have, well, the interest in ketones is to use it as a more for training as opposed to performing because it doesn't really impact within the short duration of some of our races. Um, that would kind of, I mean, if it was going to be chronic usage for an athlete training over kind of like 10 years, uh, do we bother, well, at what stage are the safety studies at the moment? Because, my, I mean, my concern as an athlete would be at what point do you wider kind of look at this and kind of what is the, what, what's their position on this at the moment? How, how sure are we that a few years Well, ago, Well, we've had people, some people have been drinking it for years. So it has absolutely no effect. But this, that's this stuff. I mean, there are salts on the market as well, which I think are really not good. So, so you can buy salts a lot cheaper. They come from China. You know, the standard is really not very high. They don't have to test. I mean, we, the, the place that we're making this at in Northumberland makes it 99.9% .9 pure. So, so you worry about impurities in any sort of supplement anyway. So we can guarantee, we can send out a, a certificate of analysis showing that it's absolutely pure. So n no heavy metals, nothing in it. That, okay, so that's quite safe. And then um, we've had animals and we've had people on it for years. And it's, it's exactly the same as in the body. So, which is why we've done it this way. You know, so it's a chiral compound, which makes it really expensive to make. And when we were first making it in the lab, it was over 2,000 pounds of, just for a litre because it was so expensive. But we've got it down to 318. And at the moment, um, we just make, we're just getting everything in to make 30 tonnes, um, which is going to bring the, the cost down to $150 a kilo. How wide are these studies? Are there, is there absolutely no knowledge so far of adverse effects of health individuals kind of exposed to Oh yes, well, we do, of course, and um, human have, have sold six tons of this stuff and there's been no, and you can always contact them and say, look, you know, you've killed me or something. And um, there's been absolutely none at all. So, so we have no trouble getting ethical approval uh, and ethics are, are really hard to get. And they, they it's, just, it's just like glucose. You know, I mean, it's just had no effect whatsoever. It's not a drug. Mm. Mm. Yes. Um, so you mentioned salts um, as another form that you can get this in. Is there, is there any other way you can make it into another form of pill? Would that ever happen or be possible? Because you mentioned that. Yeah, this, yeah, the, uh, this one um, can't be made into a pill. I mean, it can be. For the army, what we do, they wanted a whole food. So they wanted protein and, you know, carb and everything so that they just had blister pack type things. Um, and it was light and they just added water or they could just eat it. And it, it, in fact, it tasted a lot better because it was um, agglu agglomerated onto, um, you know, protein and stuff like that. And so they ta didn't taste so bad. Um, except when you, when you made it up in water or milk, it just tasted terrible because it all came out, you know, as the salt dis dissolved. Anyway, um, so you can do that and, and you can buy the salts as salts and just put it into water or whatever you want. But, this, but the salt that you have to take in to be able to raise your level is so much that you, I mean, you have to dr drink 10 grams of salt at least for a drink, uh, the same as one of these drinks here, takes in 10 grams of salt. You just don't want to do that. You don't want to do it for your hypertension or for your kidneys. And it's not feasible to make it into like a jelly for people like you did with the... Oh, it tastes terrible. <laughs> tastes terrible, awful. It stays in your mouth too long. Yeah, yeah. But people drink it, people drink it. I mean, it's mainly sold to um, quite wealthy middle-aged American men, as you can imagine, because it's anti-aging, of course, and they can afford it. Mm. Yeah. Yes? Um, you talked a little bit about um, using this uh, Parkinson's. Uh, mm. Mm. Is it really well understood 
and kind of what's happening in the cell. This is why um, this could be kind of useful treatment. Well, it, it, <clears throat> it's not. It's not re what it is for. I think for Parkinson's, it doesn't work on people who've got pa bad Parkinson's. So in Parkinson's disease, there's a loss of dopaminergic neurons, and that, and by the time you get diagnosed, they're about seventy percent gone. So that's when the tremor started, and people start to notice that you know there's things going wrong, and it works then, and it works. It stops the tremor. And it, it makes them more alert and it stops a lot of other things. So it stops the deterioration. It, it doesn't turn them back into normal people. So it, it stops continuing cell death? Yes. Okay. So it stops the cells that are still alive from dying. Okay. But it doesn't, once they're dead, they're dead and gone. And, you know, unless stem cells can do something about it, nothing will help. But it, it does suspend it, put, puts them, and so somebody will be trembling or have a tremor and, you know, um, sort of all the other things that you have, you know, the, everything else. And, um, and once they have a drink, 20 minutes later, it stops. It's amazing. It's just amazing. And so they really can feel it. But then the ones that are really bad, once they've stopped the levodopa and gone on to other drugs or they're taking masses of levodopa, it doesn't have any effect. Mm -mm. So it's, I mean, it's not a, there's no cure. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Any more questions? No, yeah. Oh, it's not, but... Uh, no, as soon as it gets near any any sort of lipase, it's broken down. So it's broken down by gut esterases, actually. Acid Sorry. It's good to the acid uh, It's not the acid. It go. It sort of it seems to go through, especially as a drink. It just goes through the gut, and it's broken down by esterases. So and and we have esterases all through the body, and mainly in the gut, but all through the body in the blood everywhere. And, and because we get foods as esters. And so if you just incubate just some blood with our ketone, within a half an hour, it's broken, completely broken down the ester linkage. Mm. But if you keep it in a bottle like this without any water, it, it lasts for years. It's perfectly stable at room temperature in the light. So I've, I've had some in my office since 2005 and I, tested every now and then it's exactly the same as when we had it, when we had it made thank you everyone for coming and let's thank Mr. Clark one more time right. for the right. thank you great good